It is the most iconic dungeon of all time. Its victims are countless and its cruelty boundless. Construction is well underway and now it is only a matter of time until a Sirarax influence is released upon my basement. Hello everyone, Wylock here. Thanks for joining me today. We're going to continue our Tomb of Horrors build. The whole thing, no compromises. So this is part two. In the first part, we did the entrance hallway, the real entrance that is, which is actually room three. Today we're going to step back, take care of some odds and ends, some house cleaning, before we move on to the dungeon proper. Now in the first episode, I was referring and reading out of the original, uh, actually it's the facsimile of the original, but the original dungeon. I'm going to switch to referring to the 5th edition version from Tales of the Yawning Portal. Honestly, I don't think this matters structurally at all. Some of the mechanics are tweaked, but whatever. At least when I do cutaways like this, you'll be looking at something other than black and white text. And where appropriate, I will still pull in artwork from the original module because it's just so charming. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. I also need to make some aesthetic decisions right now that are going to affect the entire rest of the dungeon. Now the original module had no description of what the interior generally looks like. And in fact, neither does the 5th edition version, but the 3rd edition version does. It talks about how generally, unless otherwise noted, everything is of smooth granite and doors are oak banded with iron. Let's talk doors. So there's doors throughout the dungeon and as I go through I'm not gonna say how to build a door in every single episode. I'll do it once right now and then I can just refer back to part two when I drop doors in in future episodes. I previously did clip on doors way back at the very beginning of my channel, chiseling popsicle sticks and painting them up, but that was six years ago and it's kind of a pain to do so I tried something new here. Two methods. First method, using these thin stirring sticks, chop them up to the desired height of the door. I recommend about 50 millimeters. And I also held on to the rounded ends. Then ripping a strip of cardstock, pinning five of the sticks together and binding them with that cardstock using hot glue, top and bottom. This is one side of the door and it gets hot glued to a smaller rectangle of double corrugated cardboard. Once both sides are on, hot glue a strip of cardstock around the corrugation to cover it up, glue on some of those rounded ends where the door pole would be, and paint it up. Now I've been doing wood the same way for six years now, color wise, so I thought I'd try some other approaches, basing and dry brushing with different colors, doing washes, and I mean, it looked okay considering that I can build and paint one start to finish in about eight minutes, is fine. But I wanted them to be a little bit special for this project. So I remembered this mold that I made several months ago and I used some Smoothcast 320 to make the doors. This stuff is awesome. It cures to a hard plastic in about 15 minutes and is quite paintable. After that, same approach really. Hot glued them to the center stock covered up the corrugation. Now I got a nice half inch cavity at the bottom which is what will grab onto the walls. Painted that up and maybe it's not exactly what you'd call banded with iron but whatever. I have wood and iron present and they look good enough. So unless otherwise noted, all doors in the dungeon will look like this. All right, so again, we did the real entrance, but we skipped the two false entrances, rooms one and two, right? So let's read what they say and get to building those. The corridor before you is made of plain stone, roughly worked, and it is dark and full of cobwebs. The ceiling overhead is obscured by hanging strands of webbing. Also, information for the DM only, there is a collapsing ceiling trap, along with a pair of oaken doors at the end of the passageway, which are fake, and will activate that trap. All right, so this room already is an exception to the aesthetic that is gonna be the norm. Uh, worked stone, mortared, so I'm gonna keep that in mind. And I also think I want something to represent the falling rubble in the event that the ceiling does collapse and the trap is triggered. 
By the way, if you're brand new to me, I do use a one and a quarter inch grid. It was the very first episode I ever made on this channel, making the case for it. It's a terrible video, it's really old, I didn't know what I was doing, but if you can suffer through it, uh, you'll see why one and a quarter inch grid is superior. And it is what I'm using for this entire build. Room one is 20 by 30 feet, so on a one and a quarter inch grid, the total tile size needs to be five by seven and a half. So I cut out what I call the tile foundation from chipboard. This is graphics medium chipboard. It's the stuff you find at the back of a legal pad, but I love it. I buy it in bulk and you can too. There's links in the video description below. The walls, as always, are three quarter inch high. So chipboard strips to start and then some cheap white foam board. Peeled the paper from one side and textured it up. For speed, I chose to just use this texture rolling pin. Again, the same one I used in part one and then glued that to the chipboard which in turn gets hot glued to the tile foundation. Now I'm double checking the interior dimensions so that I can cut out the foam for the floor, which gets textured in the same way. And then I apply the grid, just as in part one, lightly scoring out the one and a quarter inch grid and chasing the lines with a mechanical pencil or a ballpoint pen to widen the lines. Nice coat of pure matte Mod Podge to prime this foam. And then a black base coat, followed by a dark gray overbrush. This won't give full coverage, but that's fine. I'm really not too worried about this room. The players, if they even come across it, will probably only spend three minutes in here anyway. Then a dry brush with a light gray. and a subtle dry brush with white. Tying it all together with a black wash. This is just very watered down black acrylic paint. And the room description does include cobwebs. So my first inclination was to use some polyfill, dredge it in white PVA glue, and just stick it in some places along the wall. But eh, eh, we can do better. I remembered the Duragar caravan I did a few months ago. I loved how that webbing came out. So I used it again here just dropping hot glue straight into a tub of water randomly to make a flat, swirled up mess. Kind of looks like a cobweb and hardens instantly thanks to the water. So I sliced up some pieces of that and hot glued them onto the tile like this. If the trap is triggered and the ceiling collapses, I want some scatter rubble to show that. So I took this white expanded polystyrene, often found in packaging, and broke off some chunks. hot glued them to some chipboard and gave them a coat of Mod Podge for strength. Then some white glue and sand to flock the base, plus a few spots on the rocks themselves. Usual drill, black base coat, overbrush dark gray, dry brush light gray, and white. Wash with black. And I imagine that above the ceiling was earth. So just to get some color in this room too, I just nabbed these two scenic rubble tubs off the shelf and glued some into some random spots just to break up the gray fest that's going on here. So that room is done. I just used two of the clip-on doors to show the false double doors. The webs look neat and yeah, nice. I'm happy with this. Let's go check out room number two. The corridor before you is made of plain stone, roughly worked and mortared with a 10 foot high ceiling. There are also two doors at the end of the passage, which are both false and the sliding block trap. Aesthetically, this room appears to be the same as the first one. So I'm just gonna reuse those same techniques. Construction here is identical to room one, except that it's a longer room, easy. And the only other thing I need here is the massive sliding block. So I hot glued some slabs of chipboard together to make a massive smooth block and just painted it up with some different shades of gray just to make it a little bit distinct from the tile. It fits perfectly across the tile's interior width to demonstrate what's happened as described in the book. And so with all that done, let's get back on track and look at room seven, the forsaken prison. This miserable cubicle appears to have absolutely no means of egress. Three iron levers, each about one foot long, protrude from the south wall of the chamber. All right, so here in the Forsaken Prison, I'm actually gonna use the normal aesthetic, that granite that's gonna appear throughout the rest of the dungeon. This is a 10 by 10 room, as simple as it gets. 
That means the overall tile is two and a half inches square. But subtracting the widths of the walls, the foundation of the tile needs to be two inches. So here it is using double corrugated cardboard. And then I cut three quarter inch wide strips of the same stuff and hot glued it around the outside. So you see why I had to reduce the size of the foundation such that the overall tile ends up being two and a half inches. Also hot glued on some corrugation cladding, which is my patented term for thin cardstock. Black base coat, and then my two main grays, dark gray and gray. First, the dark gray, applied by stippling on with a bit of kitchen sponge, aiming for about 50% coverage. And then the light gray, same thing, but a little less pressure, aiming for maybe 25% coverage. The spaces themselves are one and an eighth inch squares. This is so that we have a small gap in between the spaces. However, whenever a space is up against a wall, you need to chop away a little bit. And in this case, we have four corner spaces. So all of them get trimmed down in both directions. Then I round off the corners, put a random chip in one of them, paint them up and hot glue them in. For the levers in the wall, I'll make a clip on feature. Start with a clip on blank. Whenever I say clip on blank, it simply means make a sandwich of two slabs of chipboard around double corrugated cardboard and then cover the corrugation. So much like we did with the door a few minutes ago. For the levers, I punched holes, injected with hot glue and stuck in some toothpicks. Easy enough. So that's room seven, and I ended up painting the levers with a copper color because the gunmetal was getting lost among all of that gray, whatever. Now, if anyone was unfortunate enough to end up in room seven, the only way back is through this crawl space. Book says it's three feet wide. I'm just gonna treat it as five feet, one miniature as it were. I need to think about how to execute this because it is a single wide hallway basically, and it goes underneath another room. I decided to do this straight 2D on chipboard. So I measured out my one and a quarter inch grid and drew out the path per the map. It's long, so I did it over two pieces. At first I thought I would try an earthen sort of tunnel, like it had been dug out. At least it would give some color variety, but it didn't turn out very good. And besides, this is an engineered crawl space, so it should probably be stone. So I re-blacked it and started over. Solid dark gray, and then I made a stamp. This is an old DM Scotty trick. So this is foam board, peeled the paper from one side, carved in my pattern, including the grid, and hot glued it to some double corrugated for strength. Then I put a healthy coat of a light gray on there and quickly stamped it out. So that did the trick. And in fact, this looks kind of cool, almost like a cell shaded style. I don't know, I'm gonna keep this on my notepad to explore it in a different project, but this effect ended up really interesting looking. So anyway, I drew on the path of the tunnel and blacked out the exterior. As expected, these are pretty warped due to all that paint, and the answer is simple, butter the back. So I painted it black on the other side, and about two to three hours later, voila, perfectly flat. I like this, it's something different, makes it stand out amongst all the other gray of the dungeon. Next up, we'll knock out this little hallway that connects the entrance to room eight. Technique here is identical to what we did for room seven. So this is 10 by 20, which means the tile is two and a half by five inches, reducing for wall space. I made it two by four and three quarters. It's assembled and painted up in the same way. And the idea is that the end without a wall connects to the door from room three and the wall at the far end provides the door for the players to encounter that's gonna take them to room eight. What appeared to be a statue an instant ago comes to life before your eyes. The creature flaps its wings and stares at you. All right, now room-wise, there doesn't appear to be anything special about this. It's just a room, the gargoyle is the feature, so it should be pretty easy to do. This room is 20 by 30 with a short 10-foot corridor to the east. Because that door already exists on the small hallway we built earlier, I'm gonna have no wall there. The construction technique is identical to that for room seven that we did a few minutes ago, using double corrugated cardboard and hot gluing walls to the side of the foundation and reducing the foundation based on where the walls are gonna be to make sure we preserve the underlying grid. For the spaces, I did reach a point where I thought to myself, 
why am I doing it this way? Is there a way to do this en masse? I mean, that's going to become important, especially when I get to room 25 later on. Oh god, so many freaking squares. So instead I glued them on raw and tried to paint them in place. And it went almost perfectly. The only downside is that the space edges are hard to get to and you can see some of them still have some raw spots poking through. So maybe going forward I still have to base them in black one by one by hand, but then I can do all the sponging with them installed on the tile. Still a huge time savings. As for the gargoyle itself, it is a mutated gargoyle, a modified version of the standard stat block from the monster manual, but honestly these are supposed to be high level characters, so I'm going to make a large 2 inch based miniature instead of a medium 1 inch one. Whatever. So I look at my leftover Warhammer bits. I found this old pewter body. It had been thrown in with a used army that I bought some time ago, and I have a bunch of other leftover Tyranid bits, so I just used those and cobbled together this creature. Super glue accelerant is a must. Instant, extremely strong bond. For the wings, I used plastic coated paper clips as an armature, cardstock for the skin, and just hot glued that on, and then lined it with hot glue to strengthen everything up and add some ribs, also some leftover spikes from a trigon at the points. Outside for spray primer, and then a base coat with a gray. I was thinking this gargoyle is either going to have a green or purple undertone, and then I remembered how when I painted Demogorgon a couple weeks ago, I really like how that purple stone came out. So I'm going to go with what I know. Army Painter Purple Wash, all over it, give it an hour to dry, and it's still eh, not quite there. So I lightly dry brushed with some light gray, and then hit it with a black wash, Army Painter Dark Tone. This gave me the result I was looking for. It is a stone gargoyle, but with hints and undertones of purple. So that was a fun little kit bash. It looks okay for 15 minutes of work. It was the most fun 15 minutes I had making this video. So we're gonna linger on it for a little bit, just cause. I always do something with the base, even if it's as simple as sand. I don't care if they look out of place as a result. And now let's go look at the story so far. Yeah, I'm eventually going to need a bigger table. Sorry for the poor lighting conditions here, it's hard to illuminate such a large area. So the first false entrance, easy enough, they walk up, the trap is sprung, the block moves over and fits in. Revolutionary stuff. It was the 70s. And the other false entrance. If placed correctly, these two would be much further away from room 3 than they are, but my table's just not wide enough. And honestly, after the players find the true entrance, there's no reason to have these tiles on the table anymore anyways, so whatever. Let's stroll on down the main entrance, and as you can see, this assumes the players have already found or tripped all six of the pit traps, the last of which connects to that crawl space. Now the main reason I went 2D with this is so that the tile for room 13, when I eventually get to it, can just be set on top of it, and we can accurately reproduce the map on the table. I must say, I was dreading this whole project at first, but now that I've started and got some momentum, I really don't want to stop. The prospect of the entire dungeon is really exciting to me now. Backing up, backing up, through the painted plaster door, the short connecting hallway, and into the gargoyle's lair. It is my intent to build every asset, everything needed to run this dungeon without compromise, and that includes the monsters and it'll all fit in a good sized cardboard box because it's 2.5D, so I can travel with it, bring it to conventions, etc. All right, I think that's enough for one night. I'm so glad that you're taking this journey with me. Part three, next time we're gonna do the secret door complex, followed by room 10, the Hall of Spheres. And if this whole concept of crafting for your tabletop gaming is new to you, you should know that I am not alone. Uh, there's a group of 33,000 strong and growing. Find us on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild. There's a link in the video description below, plus links for a whole bunch of other resources that will help you out. Uh, if you like this particular video today, then here's two more that I think you'll really like. And until I see you next time, I'm Wylock. Make things and play games.